Thank you for listening to this teaching from Casa View Baptist Church, located in Garland, Texas. Our mission is to love God, build relationships, and change the world. To learn more, visit casaviewbaptist.org. This is a painting in a very famous art gallery in France. It's a painting of the devil beating the man in chess, and they're playing for his soul. And he says, checkmate, I've got your soul. And the man is just, you know that, you ever do that? Well, one day, they were giving a tour through this art gallery, and this world famous chess player was in, the, was in the tour. And he's looking at it, and he stopped for a while, and he's looking at it, and the, and the tour kept going. And the tour guy came back and said, wait, wait, what are you doing? He goes, you know, I'm a world famous chess player. He said, you're either gonna have to change the painting or change the name of it, because this man still has one more move. The king still has one more move. He has not been beat by the devil. He still has one more move. He can actually move, the, the king still has one more move, and then the devil will be in checkmate. Change the picture or change the name. You need to know that God has still have one more move in your life. God is still on the throne, even when you're, oh my gosh, have you ever been there? Oh my Lord, life is bearing down, it's pulling down, I can't stand anymore, oh God. And having done all, he says, stand there for before God and let him rebuild your life. God still has one more move. The enemy cannot win on God's timetable. Now what I could have done is said, man, that's a great idea. I'm gonna preach that, that's, and use his word. The truth about it is, though, that when I watch that, I realize that that was where it was because that's what I needed to hear. The truth is, is that everybody goes through difficulties. There are three types. One difficulty is brought on because of the stupid things that you do, okay? And don't sit there and look at me and say, Carl, that has never happened to me because I just want you to know, the Bible says if we say we have not sinned, we're a liar and the truth of God is not in us. So I'm just gonna look at you and say, you're lying through your teeth. There are times all of us do stupid things, we, we fail. The second is that, is that the truth about it is that life sometimes throws you a curveball, and life is difficult. You know, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. The third is that uh, there are just times that, that you just need to understand you're attacked. And the truth is, that what I'd like to teach you today about what I am most grateful for is grace and mercy. You see, the truth is that is that grace and mercy are the exact same principle, but they're in contrapuntal directions. Mercy is you're guilty, you're hurting, or you've done something wrong, you can't fix it, you can't change it, and somebody goes, don't worry about it, I still wanna give you something great. In spite of what you've done, I wanna bless you. The grace on the other side is, is that none of us are, are just are, are, are great examples of perfection. You know, I was listening to somebody the other day and they were talking about how Dak Prescott needs to be considered for quarterback of the year. And I'm going, well, I, 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 I look, what do you think, preacher? And I said, I don't have a clue. Well, well, you, you know, I mean, his statistics, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I don't. I don't watch it. I don't read about it. Well, 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 I mean, you realize we just beat the Washington Redskins yesterday. And I go, hello, wait a second. I don't even watch professional football, and I know they're not the Redskins anymore because you've got to be PC in the D.C., you know what I mean? Well, but yeah, they're the Washington something or others, okay? The problem about it is, is that there's something or others. Dallas is going to probably make the playoffs this year. Woohoo! And they're going to make it by beating teams that all have a losing record. Isn't that exciting? 
And, and I'm not trying to knock on Cowboys fans, but the truth about it is, is that every game they've won this year, they've won by beating teams that are losers. And the teams that are winners, they've lost to. And so the truth about it is when you go, woo, yes, is not when you beat somebody you're supposed to beat. It's when you beat somebody that you can't possibly beat. I asked my wife, I told, matter of fact, I told my wife last night that I was going to explain grace and mercy through the relationship of my wife and I. I but before I start, I just want to let you know something, okay? I have never been intimate with a woman. My wife, it, 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 I, I just, okay, just period, okay? I, I, I don't hug women unless they're older than I am. And... Uh, I'm sorry. I've only kissed Ruth Gilbert. That's the only woman I've kissed on the lips other than my wife, and she was 128 at the time, and it was a funny joke. But here's the deal. With that being said, the first 10 years of my marriage, I cheated extensively on my wife. You say, well, Carl, how can you say you cheated extensively on your wife for the first 10 years of your marriage and that you've never been with a woman other than your wife? Well, it's, it's pretty easy. You see, the truth is, is that there are a lot of ways to cheat. To be frank with you, when Shelly came into my life, she's the one that convinced me to go back to church because I swore I'd never go to church again. And she started quoting scripture like all godly women are supposed to do. And uh, she convinced me to go to church. I said, well, we're going to go to church Sunday. And I went back to church for the first time in several years. And uh, uh, that's a good thing for the head bartender at Holiday Inn to do. And, uh, and so anyway, in a roundabout way, Shelly and I ended up getting married because after I begged her and finally she said yes, uh, we got married. We got married and it was, our honeymoon was spectacular. We made it all the way to Duck Hill, Mississippi. Uh, there's a stop sign right outside of that town. They don't need it, but I mean, we uh, fancy hotel room there. And about 8:45 that Sunday morning, you know, Shelly and I had our first night together, and we were in the glow of life. And I said, you "Hurry, we need to get ready because church starts in about 30 minutes." And she looked at me and she said, "We're on a honeymoon." I said, "No, sweetheart, Sunday is the Lord's day, and we're going to church." She said, "It's our honeymoon." I said, "Sweetheart, we're going to church." Who in the world goes to church on their honeymoon, right? Went through college, through seminary. I uh, remember going to school full time, working three jobs to try to provide for my family. And uh, my first pastorate, I mean, we, uh, we took a, an 82% cut in pay to leave seminary to pastor full time. And so at that church, uh, we, we were paid this huge amount of $10,000 a year total, including everything, insurance. And we're not talking 1962, we're talking 1990. And uh, boy, you can really do a lot on that. And so I got two other jobs that I worked at night so that you know, my wife, when she went to Walmart, could actually write a check that wouldn't bounce. And uh, we've been married 10 years. and. I even preached one Sunday with chicken pox. Didn't know it was at the time, but uh, I found out because the next Sunday there were no children in the children's area at all because they were all home with the chicken pox. And uh, I was the shredder then. And we've been married 10 years and never taken a Sunday off, never taken a vacation. For the most part, I worked two, three, four jobs to go through school without debt, go through seminary without debt. And, and have children without uh, maternity benefits. That, that's a real smart one we did there. And uh, one day my wife came up to me and, and uh, you need to understand, I'm full time at a church and working two night jobs. And she said, Dean, I just wanna let you know that we've been married 10 years. And I said, yes, I have. She said, you know, you've never missed a Sunday of church. And I said, Yep, I know I hadn't. Isn't that wonderful? She said, well, really not. Do you know in 10 years we've never gone on vacation? Well, you know, I've, I've been kind of working. It's hard to take off. She said, yeah, I understand that. Uh, you know, you give 
the kids and I everything except the one thing we really need, and that is you spending some time with us. And I just want to let you know that the children and I are going on vacation next week. And this is where we're going. This is where I've got reservations, and we're going. Now, now you have two options. Option one, you can go with us, and we'll have a wonderful time. I said, okay, all right. option one, when are we leaving? Well, we're leaving on Friday, and we're not coming back until the following Friday. I said, you mean we're going to miss church? And she said, uh, we're going on vacation. We're going to the hills of Tennessee to Gatlinburg, and we're going, and we're going to take some time off, and we're not going to work anything. We're not, you know, and I said, okay. I said, what's option two? The kids and I are going to go without you because we realize that there are some things in life that are more important than us. But just want to let you know, we're going to be gone for a week, but at the end of the week, we'll come back home. You say, well, Carl, what in the world does that have to do with grace and mercy? Really? Mercy is her not looking at me and saying, the kids and I are going on a vacation, and at the end of the week, we're going to mom and dad's. If you want to see us, we'll be there. You see, the truth is, that's what I deserved. which I didn't get. That's mercy. The other side of it is grace, which is option number two. I love you. The kids love you. We have fun around you. Listen, why don't you go with us? We'd love for you to go. That's grace. You see, the truth is to truly understand mercy and grace you cannot understand it outside of the idea of difficulty, failure, or tribulation. In Psalm 51, David had blown it. He had had Uriah killed. He had, had, he had been intimate with Uriah's wife. She's pregnant, delivers a baby. The baby's dead. All the guys that were in Uriah's company were killed as well. And David says this in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is what? Always before me. You see, the truth is, is that when either you and I fail or life gets difficult and we begin to hurt or we're being attacked, Usually, what we can see is that difficulty in that attack. Often when we fail, we spend the rest of our life in these glasses that are clouded by that attack. It's ever before us. David said, God, there's nothing I can do. All I can see is my failure every day. How do I move beyond that? How do I move beyond me looking back at things I've done in my life and go, okay, it's a clean slate. Verses 16 and 17, David said, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it to you. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is broken spirit, a broken contrite heart. God will not despise. David says, God, it's not something that I can give you. I can't pay off a fine. What you want is my heart to be right with you. So with that in mind, take your Bible, take your phone, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. This is for everybody in here that you've done something in your past that is a failure and all you see is life through the lens of that failure. This is for every single one of us in here that have physical problems that do not allow us to do things we wish we could do. And that debilitation is glasses that color our existence.
So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so Christ may rest in me. What does my grace is sufficient actually mean? What is Paul saying that God looks at him and says, Paul, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. You and I need to understand that grace is God's victory in spite of our weakness. God's grace in your life when you and I are weak, when we don't have the strength to accomplish things, that gives God the opportunity to do something massive. Think of all the Bible stories you've told your children growing up, your, your grandchildren. How many of you have told the story of David and Goliath? David is a little boy who goes to take his brother some cheese and crackers. You know, nabs in a seven up, RC cold in a moon pie. You know what I'm talking about? He said, Dad says, son, <coughs> son, listen, why don't you go feed your brothers who are fighting? The truth about it is the brothers aren't fighting, are they? The brothers are actually cowering on the other side of the hill, refusing to fight. So David shows up, right? He's given his brother Shimei something to eat. And Goliath calls out, bring me your champion. My God against your God, send out your champion. David goes, who's that big guy? Well, that's Goliath. Wow. I bet he's got a winning record, doesn't he? David, Goliath's almost seven feet tall. You realize his spear is three times your height. Matter of fact, David, the head on the top of the spear is as big as your head. Now, David, you got ruddy cheeks. You're a cute little punk kid. Just give us the food and go home. And David goes, but why don't you go fight him? In my version, Shemai looks at him and says, right. Like I can compare to that. Shemai was there to do what? To do what? He was there to fight Goliath, wasn't he? He was part of the army. He was part of God's army. He was part of the army that God said, I'll make sure that your enemies will fall at your feet if you'll just trust me. And he's standing going, mm -hmm. why do we tell the story of David and Goliath? Because the grace that God gives David, David's the ruddy little kid who faces the giant with the resolve of God. The giant looks at David and says, you send me a punk kid? And the punk kid looks at Goliath and says, God is gonna put you in my hands today. God's grace means that God can accomplish in you, through you, and to you anything that he desires in spite of you. To really understand what David was talking about, you've got to go back to verse 7 and 8. Notice what he says. Of because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, what is conceited? You ready? It actually means puffed up head. To keep me from having a puffed up head. Who this is going to bless your heart. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of God to torment me. One of the things I used to love to do when we were at parties with balloons, and I know you would never do this. You would never do this. I'd take out my pocket knife. And I'd get a balloon and I'd go up behind somebody and I'd go pop and make it pop behind their head and watch them jump and scream. And well, I was just, I was just the mean kind of guy, you know. I, I thought it was funny. You're going to, Carl, what does this have to do with this? David said that to keep me from having a head that was blown up like a balloon, God allows Satan to put a thorn in my balloon so that my head would pop and I would always stay grounded. Grounded to what? 
Notice he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away. God, would you take this difficulty away from me? It had to bug him. <coughs> it had to be like King David said, God, my difficulty, it's in front of me every single day. So what does he say? My grace is sufficient for you. You see, today, what you and I need to understand is that His grace is sufficient. What happens when you and I decide God's grace is sufficient for me? What happens? We're no longer debilitated in our attitude about a failure of the past. The true mercy and grace is that that's been over 25 years ago, and you know what? My wife is never angelic about it. You know what I mean by angelic? She never gets up in the air and starts harping. I remember the first 10 years we were married. You never did anything with us, and now you're not going to do anything with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. She just let it go. <clears throat> the entire week we're on vacation. She looked at me and go, it is so nice to be with you. Listen, the kids are asleep. Let's go take a walk outside. We're going through Cade's Cove and I look up in a tree and there's a black bear eating berries out of the top of a tree and I look at my kids and go, y'all wanna see something cool? Come over here. They're looking up at this black bear eating berries out of a tree. Jesse looks at me and said, Dad, thank you so much. This is so neat. Thank you for doing this for us. And I, I just start crying, why? I wasn't the instigator. I wasn't the originator. I was the procrastinator. If it wouldn't have been for a wife who said, we're going with you or without you, if you want to spend a week with us, you need to come on and get in the wagon because we're going. <coughs> and here my child is looking at me saying, Dad, thank you so much for doing this. In the Amplified Bible, 12.9 is translated this way. And he said to me, sufficient for you is my grace. Those of you that are in here hurting today because of something that you've done and it's ever before you and you... you, you and you're like David in, in Psalm 51, this load's just too much. You ready, guys? Can I ask you a question? What did you do wrong that was so big that God didn't down the cross to take care of? Nothing. You say, well, Carl, you don't know what I did. I could care less what you did. God's grace is sufficient. Think about, think, think about Samson. What a failure. But in that one moment of his death when God renewed his strength, miraculous things took place. My grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because my power, the, please put that back on the screen. For my power in infirmity is perfected. Do you, do you understand? <clears throat> when you don't have the ability, when you're too tired, when you don't feel like you have the, 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 the opportunity, or when you've done something in the past that's a failure, <clears throat> do you understand it's when God uses you from that position that victory to it goes to God and not you? <clears throat> David looks at Goliath and says, not by might, but by power, but by what? But by God. He will place you in my hands today. 
Even people that don't know God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, walking through the fiery furnace, what did the king see? I thought I told you to put those three in there. Who's the fourth guy in the fire? Well, that looks like God. You realize that an un ungodly kingdom proclaims that Jehovah is God. Why? Because they, through faith, walked in the fire trusting God. You don't get that without the difficulty. Therefore, because of this most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Paul says, when it comes through the time when I'm down, when it's struggling, when I've blown it, when I can't, that's when I get excited because I know that God is fixing to do something amazing in my life. There is nothing on the pace of the earth that is more fulfilling and amazing to be able to stand here in front of you every single week and tell you how much God loves you. It is the passion of my life. But the truth about it is, is I don't do it from a position of victory. I do it from a position of realizing that if it were not for God's grace, when I was the guy running from God, executive bartender, working on a degree in opera, I happened to run across a godly Christian woman who wouldn't compromise anything in life. There's no way that a guy like me deserved that. It's called grace and mercy. So in your life, when it starts to get tough, you need to start getting excited because that's when you know that God has an opportunity to do something amazing in your life. Shelly's going to come to the piano. One of my favorite songs is really about 2 Corinthians 12, 9. As an invitation, I'd like to sing it. There are some amazing people in this room. You're all amazing. But every Sunday... <laughs> Every Sunday I tell you, you want to talk to somebody, I'll be hanging out in the back. Well, today I'm not going to be. I haven't asked him. Got there in a blue shirt, and the lady beside him, that's Terry and Kim. Uh, grace and mercy, you'll never find more in anybody. Back in the back and to the left, that's James Heath. I remember sitting down with James Heath one day saying, James, because of something that's happened, I think I need to quit the pastorate just broken-hearted. I'll never forget James and Chuck Lawball praying me through that time, encouraging me. His wife Julie standing over there between her son and her daughter-in-law. Then on the far side is Donna Donna. These are all people that are back in the back. I, I, I love Donna and I tell Donna about it, but I love Donna and I tell Donna about it. The greatest thing that you can ever do when life is shoving you down and you're wondering, how am I going to? Is to find somebody whose life and heart is filled with grace and mercy and allow them to pray with you and encourage you. So as we stand while I sing, if you need to find somebody and talk with them, James can pull off the keyboard, the board back there. 
I didn't ask the other's permission, but I'm telling you, I personally have sat in the middle of their grace and mercy and courage. You stand, we listen to this song. Thank you.